It's a scene out of countless romance novels and prestige period pieces, an elegantly dressed Victorian lady laced too tightly in her corset is suddenly overcome by a case of the vapors and swoons, collapsing into a convenient fainting couch designed for just this purpose. Immediately a servant or dashing doctor rushes to her side, uncorks a small bottle of smelling salts, and holds it under her nose. She gasps, springs back to consciousness, and all is well. Of course, most of this scenario is pure fiction. Contrary to popular depictions, the corset was not some diabolical, patriarchal torture device that caused women to faint constantly. Indeed, working women regularly wore them in the fields and factories, while the so-called fainting couches were nothing of the sort, merely ordinary daybeds for lounging. But smelling salts were a real thing used for centuries to rouse both men and women from fainting spells. Indeed, they remain popular to this day among many professional athletes. But just what are smelling salts? Who invented them? How do they work? And are they safe to use? Well, lace up your corset, position your couch accordingly, and prepare to be shocked into unconsciousness as we dive into what exactly are smelling salts and how do they work. To begin with, the most common compound used in smelling salts is ammonium chloride or ammonium carbonate, both traditionally known as sal ammoniac. In nature, this is typically found around geothermal features like volcanoes and fumaroles where it's formed from ammonia vapors emerging from the Earth's crust or in other ammonia-rich areas like large deposits of bird or bat guano. An aqueous solution known as Aquila coelestis was also produced by a distillation of deer antlers, hence the alternative name of spirit of heart's horn. Today, however, it's usually synthesized from the reaction of hydrochloric acid or carbon dioxide with ammonia, itself produced from hydrogen and atmospheric nitrogen. Throughout history, sal ammoniac has been used in a wide variety of applications, including the refining of gold and silver, the dyeing of cloth, the tanning of leather, and alchemy, the ancient quest to produce the mythical philosopher's stone believed to turn base metals into gold, produce the elixir of life, and otherwise help a certain dark lord who really needs to consult with an otolaryngologist to return. The pungent compound even found its way into food. Indeed, before the widespread adoption of baking soda and baking powder, sal ammoniac was commonly used as a leavening agent in baked goods and in the form of refined baker's ammonia remains a key ingredient in many traditional recipes including Polish heart's horn cookies. It's also the key flavoring agent in salmiak, a pungent salted licorice popular in Finland, Scandinavia, Germany, and Denmark. Finally, sal ammoniac was widely used in medicine both as an ingredient in various curative elixirs and on its own as a restorative for fainting. The earliest written description of the substance being used in this application comes from the writings of first century Roman writer and naturalist Pliny the Elder, who in his 77 CE treaty Natural History refers to it as Hamoniacus sal. In a 1666 medical treaty, Irish scientist Robert Boyle, most famous for his work with gases, recommended inhaling sal ammoniac as a cure for giddiness of the head and in violent headaches and in epileptic fits and for easing obstinate grief and melancholy. However, it it was not until Georgian and Victorian areas of the late 18th to 19th century that smelling salts truly became fashionable. During this period, ammonium chloride or carbonate was typically dissolved in a mixture of water, vinegar, or alcohol, and various perfumes like lavender oil to create what was known as aromatic spirits of ammonia. This was then soaked into a piece of sponge and carried around in often elaborately decorated bottles known as vinaigrettes. These were direct descendants of objects known as pomanders, hollow containers filled with aromatic spirits used since Middle Ages to ward off various diseases, including the bubonic plague, aka the Black Death. This was based on the now-defunct miasma theory, which held that diseases were caused by various noxious vapors or gases. This tradition survives in the name of diseases like malaria, which translates as bad air, and refers to the belief that the illness was transmitted by miasmas emitted by swamps and marshes, rather than, as we now know, the mosquitoes which commonly live in such environments. Vinaigrettes were also roughly analogous to snuff boxes for carrying powdered tobacco or snuff, which reached the peak of their popularity in the 18th century and were carried by every fashionable gentleman of the period. Later, aromatic spirits of ammonia were commonly sealed into small glass ampules covered in a cloth sleeve, which not only protected the user's fingers and contained the glass shard when the ampule was broken, but also absorbed and slowly released the liquid via evaporation. Such ampules were commonly found in first aid kits well into the 20th century and are still manufactured and sold to this day. 
but whatever their physical form, smelling salts are properly used by holding the container around 10 to 15 centimeters from the person's nose. Then the ammonium carbonate spontaneously decomposes into ammonia, carbon dioxide, and water. The pungent ammonia fumes irritate the victim's mucous membranes, stimulating a sharp inhalation reflex. As for fainting, more technically known as syncope, it can be caused by temporary lack of oxygen to the brain, so this sudden inhalation can potentially be enough to restore consciousness. Although, of course, fainting itself can have dozens of different causes, including low blood sugar, electrolyte imbalance, overexertion, restriction of breathing, standing up too quickly, and what is known as situational syncope. Heart and breathing rate are regulated by two branches of the nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, which speeds up the action of the heart and lungs, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which slows them down. If someone encounters a situation that triggers the fight or flight response, such as anxiety regarding an upcoming event like a dental appointment, an immediate threat like encountering a wild animal, or a phobia trigger like getting an injection, their bloodstream will be flooded with hormone epinephrine, aka adrenaline, from the adrenal glands atop the kidneys. This all causes the heart and breathing rate to rapidly increase in order to supply sufficient oxygen to the muscles. However, if this increase occurs too rapidly, then the parasympathetic nervous system via the medulla in the brain and the afferent vagus nerve may overcompensate, triggering a rapid slowing of the heart rate and temporary loss of blood flow and oxygen to the brain. However, the Georgians and Victorians had a rather different understanding of how smelling salts worked. Fainting, along with various other psychological and physiological conditions, especially in women, was commonly referred to as the vapors and as the name suggests, was thought to be caused by vital emanations of vapors escaping the womb. This idea was closely related to the ancient four humors theory, the idea that all disease was caused by an imbalance of four vital bodily fluids, or humors, black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm, as well as the now defunct diagnosis of female hysteria, a catch-all term which ascribed nearly every female affliction to disturbances of the uterus. According to this theory, smelling salts were believed to restore these vapors to the body and revitalize health. Yet while smelling salts are popularly associated with swooning Victorian women, this was not always the case. In the Georgian era, smelling salts were commonly carried and used by men to maintain alertness, cleanse the air against pestilence miasmas, and treat a wide variety of common ailments, including headaches, sickness, fainting, sudden frights, hysteric and hypochondrial disorders, lowness of spirits, convulsive apoplexies, vertigos, and all nervous disorders. They were also used in attempts to revive stillborn babies and drowning victims, as described in Dr. Alexander Johnson's 1773 compilation, Relief from Accidental Death. The bodies of drowned persons, generally found wet, cold, and stiff, must immediately be well dried, placed into temperate air, and rubbed with dry and warm flannels with other cloths or flesh brush. If dry rubbing does not soon prove efficacious, then some spirits are to be sprinkled upon the rubbers. The spirits thus used are volatile spirit of sal ammoniac, hartshorn, or a de luce mixed with brandy, rum, or malt spirits. Interestingly, in 1816, Harriet Westbrook, the estranged first wife of English romantic poet Percy Bysshe Shelley, drowned herself in the Serpentine Lake at London's Hyde Park. Efforts to revive her included the use of smelling salts, artificial respiration using bellows, and the application of electrical shocks, all of which may have inspired Shelley's second wife Mary's groundbreaking novel Frankenstein, or The Modern Prometheus, written two years later. And while such resuscitation methods might sound rather unpleasant, it could always be worse, as outlined in our previous video when doctors literally blew smoke up your butt. Georgian women also commonly use smelling salts, though typically not to revive them from full-blown fainting fits. Rather, at the time, it was considered fashionable for proper upper-class ladies to suffer from nerves or delicate sensibilities, growing faint but not outright fainting in reaction to upsetting news and other mildly unpleasant experiences. A whiff of smelling salts would then clear the air and their minds and restore their nerves. The trend of women fully fainting in such situations did not emerge until the Victorian era, but contrary to popular belief, this was likely not the result of tightly laced corsets, poor diet, overheating from bulky dresses, toxins like arsenic, lead, and mercury in the cloth thighs, and cosmetics, or other environmental factors. Rather, it's generally thought, like the early Georgian trend of delicate constitutions, this constant swooning was likely a deliberate performance of femininity as it was then understood, strongly influenced by the popular fiction of the time. 
Indeed, Samuel Richardson's groundbreaking 1740 novel Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded, set the template for this kind of behavior, with his titular heroine constantly fainting and having to be revived using smelling salts. It was two hours before I came to myself, and just as I got a little upon my feet, he coming in, I fainted away again with the terror, and so he withdrew. Mrs. Jervis gave me her smelling bottle and had cut my laces and set me in a great chair. She is now, you see, quite well again. This I heard, more she might say, but I fainted away once more at those words, and at his clasping his arms about me again. When I came a little to myself, I saw him sit there and the maid Nan holding a smelling bottle to my nose, and no Mrs. Jukes. Even contemporary commentators were aware of the performative nature of the swooning trend, with one author writing from the perspective of the sense of smell, opining that I am also peculiarly beneficial to swooning ladies, and as there are many of this stamp who faint away merely for the pleasure of being attended to and having half a dozen young men buzzing around them, these, let me tell you, are under very considerable obligations to me. It is, moreover, under my immediate protection that Cell Poignant, A de Luce, and in a hundred other filthy compositions are sold for 12 times their value and ushered into ballrooms, theaters, and all fashionable crowds. In his 1882 memoir, Some Experiences of Barrister's Life in the English Legal System, William Ballantine commented on the trend of women swooning at convenient moments on the witness stand, especially in cases involving alleged sexual impropriety. I fear that many innocent people have suffered. Juries in many of these instances seem to bid adieu to common sense. The tears of a good-looking girl efface arguments of counsel and the suggestions of reason. However absurd and incredible the story told may be, a fainting fit and an appropriate time removes from their minds all its improbabilities. Charles Dickens also frequently mocked the trend in novels like Bleak House and Martin Chuzzlewit, dismissing the behavior as wilting on demand. Nonetheless, smelling salts remained in common use throughout the century, being carried by fashionable ladies, men, doctors, and even police constables just in case. However, the full subtleties and socio-sexual dimensions of the Victorian swooning trend are far beyond the scope of this video and are subjects for another time. Now, while smelling salts are usually effective for reversing temporary unconsciousness, care must be exercised in their use. This is because the corrosive ammonia vapors can easily burn the victim's sensitive mucous membranes, as alluded to in Charles Dickens' 1854 novel Hard Times. On his way home, he took the precaution of stepping into a chemist's shop and buying a bottle of the very strongest smelling salts. By George, said Mr. Bounderby, if she takes it in the fainting way, I'll have the skin off her nose at all events. And while smelling salts are the best remembered old-timey method for restoring consciousness, they were but one weapon in the Victorian doctor's vast arsenal. By the middle of the 20th century, however, the use of smelling salts had largely fallen out of fashion as it was recognized that syncope is usually a temporary condition that corrects itself within a few minutes. Indeed, unconsciousness which persists longer than a few minutes is usually a sign of a much more serious condition that requires immediate medical intervention. Nonetheless, until very recently, ammonia smelling salts remain one of the basic seven components of kits used to treat medical emergencies during dental procedures, along with epinephrine to stimulate heart function and counter anaphylactic shock, antihistamine diphenhydramine to counter allergies, nitroglycerin to treat angina pectoris, aspirin to prevent blood clotting, and glucose to raise blood sugar. Smelling salts have also recently fallen victim to government food and drug regulations. As their use predates the passing of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938, ammonia inhalants were originally grandfathered into the United States Food and Drug Administration, or FDA's Drug Efficacy Study Implementation, or DESI, which requires pharmaceutical companies to demonstrate the effectiveness of a new drug for one or more of its labeled indications. However, the 2020 Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, or CARES Act, reclassified ammonia inhalants as a Category 1 drug, which cannot be marketed without FDA approval. In the wake of this legislation, smelling salts all but disappeared from the U.S. market with one exception, ammonia toilets manufactured by XGen Pharmaceuticals. However, ammonia inhalants continue to be manufactured in other countries and remain extremely popular in many professional sports, including boxing, weightlifting, and American football, where a quick pick-me-up to temporarily restore alertness and performance can mean the difference between winning and losing a match. Indeed, a 2005 study determined that up to 70 to 80% of the National Hockey League players regularly use smelling salts during games. As New Jersey Devils forward Kyle Palmieri stated in a 2016 interview, I love them. It doesn't give you any kind of energy, it just wakes you up. It's almost like a cerebral way of saying, hey, it's game time now, it's time to get going. But you know what would also work to do that? Just take a deep breath just like it makes you do. 
But in any event, while there is no rule in the NHL against using smelling salts, and most players claim they only use them to clear their sinuses, their use in certain high contact sports like boxing, rugby, and American football is potentially highly dangerous as the temporary alertness they can seem to provide can mask signs of concussions or more serious brain injury. Furthermore, the sharp inhalation and recoil reflex induced by smelling salts can potentially exasperate cervical spine injuries. For this reason, use of smelling salts has been officially banned in U.S. boxing competitions since the 1960s. Exposure to ammonia vapors can also be dangerous in and of itself, a fact understood for hundreds of years. In his 1775 work, The Family Female Physician, or the Treaty on the Management of Female Complaints and of Children in Early Infancy, Scottish physician Alexander Hamilton, no, not that Alexander Hamilton, states that during childbirth, it is very common for the attendants to endeavor to rouse the patient by the application of various substances to the nose as smelling salts, hearts, horns, spirits, etc. But such practices are very improper for when the patient is in a languid, irritable state, any stimulating medicine, rashly snuffed up, might endanger suffocation or by exciting violent coughing or sneezing would induce excessive flooding, internal bleeding, which in a few hours might prove fatal. Accidentally drinking smelling salts can be even more dangerous as this anecdote from the career of the 18th century English physician Sir Richard Jebb dramatically illustrates. During the vacation, being at home with his mother, who for several months had been confined to her bed and was attended by Sir Richard Jebb, he was ordered a white emulsion draft, and that being by the servant confused with the vial of E. de Luce employed to revive his mother in her fainting, he in mistake took up this identical bottle and drank it off immediately to the amount of two ounces. Feeling this fiery ingredient within him, he screamed aloud, he was burning alive, burst out of the room and rushing into the kitchen for water, which he found boiling on the fire, he then seized upon the butter on the shelf, first knocking down the servant who attempted to hold him from leaping up, thinking he was mad, and he almost instantly devoured a roll of it. His dying mother, roused by the mournful cry, I am poisoned, I am poisoned, got out of bed and coming down the stairs, found her son now faint and weltering in the blood which he vomited up in torrents and no conscious of her own ills, tried to soothe those of her son night and morning. He took nothing but linseed oil, being supported wholly by glisters, and by dint of a fine constitution and a natural cheerfulness of mind, he miraculously escaped but reduced to a mere shadow. However, in the end, as noted, outside of professional sports or antique first aid kits, you are unlikely to encounter smelling salts in the wild. But as previously mentioned, they were never really necessary in the first place. Just take a deep breath. But I mean, hey, if you're really into Victorian roleplay, go ahead and grab the smelling salts, we guess. We don't judge. This is a safe space.